Hi everyone. Hope you're all well. Um, I wanted to do this video on the sinner's prayer and being saved and what it means. Uh, where do I start? Well, I guess I would start. Pardon me. Bit my tongue. Um, at Joel 2:32. Joel is found in the Old Testament. Joel 2, chapter 2, verse 32, from the Amplified Bible, it reads, And it shall come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved from coming judgment. For on Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape. As the Lord has said, even among the remnant survivors, whom the Lord calls, so it's talking about the day of judgment when the, when the coming judgment comes and it's coming very very rapidly there will be those who will be saved and how would they be saved by calling on the name of the Lord so having said that let's find out where else does it say that it says it in Roman 10, Romans 10 13 for whoever calls on the name of the Lord in prayer will be saved okay fair enough does it say it in the other places? Sure does. Acts 2.21 And it shall be that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, invoking, adoring and worshipping the Lord Jesus, that's what calling upon his name in, in, encompasses, shall be saved or rescued spiritually. So, okay, we've seen three places in the Bible where it says that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. So, what is his name? Well, let's go to a Hebrew word study. The name of Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua. Now, if I was to say... Um, a phrase like... There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I would say, if I was talking in Hebrew, I would say this. There is Yeshua in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Yeshua. His name means salvation. Isn't that amazing? His name means salvation. So salvation is of God. And while he was on the earth, for those 33 years, back some 2,000 odd years ago, he called himself God. He said, I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now, I think that's amazing. It's it's just one of those things that it's mind boggling. He sent his son and his son was named Yeshua, which means God is salvation is of God or salvation itself, salvation. Now by calling on his name you are saved. Sorry, someone at the gate. So, John 1, the deity of Jesus Christ. And some people say Jesus was just a man. I say, and the Bible says, that Jesus was God. Jesus himself said he was God. So the deity of Jesus Christ. In the beginning, this is John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, which is Christ. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God himself. He was continually existing. In the beginning, co-eternally with God. All things were made and came into existence through him. And without him, not even one thing was made that has, sung, has come into being. In him was life, 
and the power to bestow life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it, or overpower it, or appropriate it, or absorb it, and is unreceptive to it. I think that's amazing. It, that first verse of John says that Jesus is God. It talks about creation. In the beginning, before all time, time was invented by God, was the Word. And we all know that Jesus is the Word, because it says so in the Bible. Um, that He called Himself the Word. I am the Word. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. When I speak, you can't see my words, but they are an extension of me. When you speak, I can't see your words, but they're an extension of you. When God speaks, Jesus is that extension. He is the Word of God, made flesh. John 1.14, the Word made flesh. And the Word, Christ, Mashiach in Hebrew, became flesh and lived among us. And we actually saw his glory, glory as belongs to the one and only begotten Son of the Father, the Son who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, who is full of grace and truth, absolutely free of deception. That's Jesus in the flesh. He is God's word made flesh. And then God's word is a sword. And it's a double-edged sword, and it pricks the heart, pricks the heart of every man. So that's my prayer for this video, that the Word of God will prick the heart of everyone who watches it. Um, and that the Holy Spirit will teach the hearts of everyone who watches this video. Now we've gone from Joel 2.32... Romans 10, 13 and Acts 2, 21, which all say, call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Now we know that that is Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, which is literally translated Jesus the Messiah. We go from there to, let me see, praying because I'm going to talk about the sinner's prayer. So we need to know, find out what the prayer does. Now this is Jesus talking to his disciples. I'm going to read from chapter 16 of John, verse 23, and I'm going to go on to 17, chapter 17. So I'm just going to read for you. The title, this is the Amplified Bible, and there's a title, it says, Prayer Promises. Starting from verse 23. In that day you will not need to ask me about anything I assure you and most solemnly say to you whatever you ask the Father in my name Jesus's name as my representative he will give you until now you have not asked the Father for anything in my name but now ask and keep on asking and you will receive so that your joy may be full and complete so up until that time when Jesus came they were asking God, the Father, for, for requests and, and petitions and, and so on and so forth. But now, Jesus is telling them, from now on, ask in my name, because my name is what saves. So he would have said, ask in the name of Yeshua, ask in the name of salvation. I have told you these things in figurative language, veiled language, proverbs, the hour parables. The hour is now coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I am not saying to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, because it will be unnecessary, for the Father himself tenderly loves you, everybody, every man, woman and child who has ever lived, who is living and who will ever live. He loves every single one. Because you have loved me and have believed that I have that I came from the Father. I came from the Father and have come into the world again. I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, 
Now you are speaking plainly to us and not in figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. Because of this we believe, without any doubt, that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you, do you now at last believe? Take careful notice. An hour is coming and has arrived when you will be all scattered, each to his own home, leaving me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. In the world you, have, you will have tribulation and distress and suffering. But be courageous, be confident and be undaunted, be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. Amen. My conquest is accomplished, my victory abiding. So I go over to chapter 17 now. This is the high priest's prayer. This is beautiful. The high priest is Jesus, is Yeshua HaMashiach. When Jesus had spoken these things, the things that I just read, he raised his eyes to heaven in prayer and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that your Son may glorify you, just as you have given him power and authority over all mankind, now glorify him, so that he may give eternal life to all who, are, who you have given him to, to be his permanently and forever. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true supreme and sovereign God, and in the same manner know Jesus as the Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you down here on the earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory and majesty that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name and revealed your very self, your real self, to the people whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me. They have kept and obeyed your word. Now, at last, they know, with confident assurance, that all you have given me is from you. It is really and truly yours. For the words which you gave me I have given them, and they received and accepted them, and truly understood, with confident assurance, that I came from you, from your presence, and they believe, without any doubt, that you sent me. I pray for them. He is our. He ever lived to make intercession for us. He prays for us. Isn't that beautiful? I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those who have given me because they belong to you. And all things that are mine are yours, and all things that you that are yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, yet they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, Keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, salvation, so that they may be one just as we are. So the Father and the Son are one, and the Son and the Father are one. They are salvation. I was keeping them in your name which you have given me. I guarded them and protected them, and not one of them was lost except the son of destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. He's talking about Judas Iscariot. That's the prayer that the high priest prayed to God. I think it's beautiful. I think it's just beautiful. Then the disciples went out into the world and preached the good news, which is... 2 Corinthians chapter 5 I'm going to go from chapter 11 Therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord and understand the importance of obedience and worship we persuade people to be reconciled to Him through Yeshua, salvation, through salvation but we are plainly known to God. He knows everything about us. And I hope that we are plainly known also in your consciences, your God-given discernment. Everybody has a measure of discernment. 
We are not commending ourselves to you again, but we are giving you an occasion to be rightfully proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in outward appearances, the virtues they pretend to have, rather than what is actually in the heart. See, God looks at the heart. He looks at your heart. He doesn't care what you look like on the outside. He doesn't care that you're a supermodel. He doesn't care that you're ugly. He doesn't care. He doesn't. It doesn't matter to him. It's not important. He sees what's here in the heart. Um, where was I up to? If we were out of our mind, just unstable, just unstable fanatics, as some critics would say. So many of us are called crazy because we believe in Jesus. It is for God. We we're crazy for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for your benefit. For the love of Christ controls and compels us. Because we have concluded this, that one died for all. This is the crux. Therefore all died, and he died for all, so that all those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for their sake. That's talking about Yeshua. That's the, the act of salvation right there. So from now on, we regard no one from human point from a human point of view according to worldly standards and values. Though we have known Christ from a human point of view, we no longer know him as in this way. So he was human. He came in the flesh as a man. But he died as a Messiah. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is, grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as a saviour, he is a new creature reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition, have passed away. You're now a new creature, a new creation in Jesus. In Jesus. The old things, the previous moral and, and spiritual condition, have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings a new life. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to be born again. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the entire gospel in a nutshell. Um, so, we've called upon the name of the Lord. We've found out what the name of the Lord is. And we've called upon him. It's Yeshua, Hamashiach, Yeshua. Salvation is from God. So now... What do we do once we're saved? Well, I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 3. Blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ, just as in his love he chose us in Christ, actually you've selected us for himself as his own before the foundation of the world so we were predestined if you're going to give your heart to Jesus you it was Jesus knew you would he knew he would exercise your free will to do so which is more important he chose us in Christ actually selected us for himself as his own before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy that is consecrated set apart for him purpose driven and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined and lovingly planned for us. Sorry. To be adopted to himself as his own children through Jesus Christ in accordance with the kind intention and good pleasure of his will. So coming to Christ, coming to Jesus, Yeshua, we all belong to Jesus, every single one of us, who ever lived, who lives and who will ever live. We all belong to him. He's our father. We are his children. Some of us will accept that, as a free, accept that in their free will choices and others won't. So we have to pray for those who won't. We have to pray that they will. That's what the predestination means. Um, okay. So Ephesians 6. Once we've become saved, 
this is what we need to do every day because we're not fighting a spiritual battle uh, a, a fleshly battle we're not fighting enemies that are real um, uh, that they're real but we're not fighting enemies that are flesh and blood we're fighting spiritual powers so the, we have to put on the armor of God every day so once you've said the sinner's prayer which I'm going to read out soon I need you to put on this armor every day to protect yourself it's God's armor it's called the armor of God in conclusion be strong in the Lord draw your strength from him and be empowered through your union with him you've just made a union with him by saying the sinner's prayer and in the power of his boundless might put on the full armor of God for his precepts are like the splendid armor of a heavily armed soldier so that you may be able to successfully stand up against all the schemes and the strategies and the seats of the devil for our struggle is not against flesh and blood contending only with physical components physical opponents but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world, world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. Therefore, put on the on complete armour of God, that, so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger. And having done everything that the crisis demands, to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious, stand firm and hold your ground, having tightened the wide band of truth, personal integrity, moral courage around your waist, the truth of the word of God. The tightened, tightened around, sorry, tightened the wide band of truth around the waist and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, an upright heart, and having strapped on your feet the gospel of peace in preparation, the gospel of the preparation of the gospel of peace, to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news which we just read in 2 Corinthians above all lift up the protective shield of faith with which you can extinguish extinguish all the flames flaming arrows of the evil with evil one and the wicked and take the helmet of salvation the helmet of Yeshua and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God which pricks the heart of every man with all prayer and petition in prayer, with specific requests at all times, on every occasion and in every season, in the spirit and with this view, stay alert with all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer for all God's people. And pray for me, me, you, everybody, that words may be given to me when I open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news of salvation of Yeshua from which I am an ambassador in chains and pray that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly and courageously as I should that's what you need to say every day that's Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 to 20 that's the armour of God chapter excuse me so now we're going to say this in this prayer if you want to say this in this prayer, join in with me. But before I do that, I'm just going to read you the ABCs. This is what we've got to do, and then we'll say this in this prayer. The ABCs of salvation, of the ABCs of Yeshua. A. Admit you are a sinner in need of a rescue, in need of a saviour, in need of redemption. B. Believe that Jesus is that saviour, that he lived, died, rose from the dead, and is coming again. C. Confess this belief out loud with your mouth that's the ABC's of Yeshua ABC's of salvation now I'll read out the sinner's prayer this is how I've written it out it's it might be different to, in some places but this is how I've written it out Abba Father I am coming to you as a sinner I admit I have sinned and I need salvation I need a savior I believe that Yeshua Jesus lived I believe he is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins to save me from an eternal death because of my sins. I believe that by God's power he was raised from the dead and that he is coming again to claim all who believe and have accepted him as Saviour, Redeemer, Messiah. I say this prayer out loud as a confession of my faith in Jesus, Yeshua. I thank you, Yeshua, for shedding your blood to save me. I ask you now to send your Holy Spirit to me as a comfort, 
a guide and a teacher and help me to sin no more. Amen. I hope you've all prayed that prayer and God bless.